All right, guys, we uh, <laughs> we got a good one here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Amit. I'm new onto the finance investing business scene on YouTube. Really started about a month ago. Um, I've seen some good traction. We're at about 1,500 subscribers right now, 1,500. Uh, it's been about a month of really taking YouTube seriously. Reached out to Tom Nash. He's a really awesome guy. He said yes to this interview, and it was a great, great vibe. A couple things I want to say before you get into this video. Number one, uh, we were supposed to go for an hour. It ended up being 35 minutes because his computer just wasn't cooperating for the first 20 minutes. Like for some reason, the webcam was, it just, and he had a hard stop at the end of that hour because he had to go. So we could only get this uh, interview done for 35 minutes. Now, in that time, we talked about a bunch of things. We talked about his personal life. We talked about how he feels about Elizabeth Warren. We talked about his father, his uh, upbringing in Russia. So we dive deep into some topics that I don't think you guys have seen Tom talk about before. Um, and he was really just sort of really talking about his early life and what got him to go into corporate finance and what that meant for someone who was not really that good of a kid. There's a lot of good deep stuff in there. So if you're a Tom fan or you want to know a little bit more about his life, I hope this interview and this podcast gives a little bit better of an explanation. Now, he's a big guy on Palantir. My channel right now is primarily oriented around Palantir because I have a heavy position in that and I love doing content about that. Uh, we only got to talk about it for like five, six minutes because again, he had a hard stop in those first 20 minutes. Uh, his computer just wasn't responding. So at the end of the video, he said, uh, if we get 100 likes on this video, he will give us a part two. Now, I have never said, to the best of my knowledge, and I think I'm actually absolutely accurate on this, I have never asked to like or subscribe any one of the videos that I put out on YouTube. And I really don't have the intention to do that because I think it's kind of cheesy sometimes to ask people always that, like, I just, I just, if you like it and you subscribe, I think you'll like it and subscribe. And that's kind of the growth that I've been seeing over the past month with 1500 people voting with that subscribe button because they do like the content. So I want the content to speak for itself. However, Tom is challenging me because I'm a new YouTuber to the game. So he's like, let's see if your audience actually really cares about this content. And he said, you got to get 100 likes on this video. So please make sure to like it. This is the first time I'm really asking you guys because uh, he'll give us a part two. And that part two will have a good hour to really dive deep into Palantir. We, I got to ask him one question about it and we didn't get, it was very surface level because we just didn't have time to go deep into it. So uh, give this video a like, let's get it to 100 and uh, we'll get a part two and we'll talk a lot, lot more about Palantir and all the things going on in it. This is the first episode of a, I guess, a podcast on this, on this, uh, what do you call this, on this, on this channel. First time I'm doing this. Uh, couldn't think of a better guest. I think it was dope. I think it was fun. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys uh, enjoy the questions. Let me know what questions you would like to see me ask Tom in the future. More about Palantir, but could also be about other things. Because if we do a part two, we'll ask him the other stuff. And we'll keep going from there. Hope you guys enjoy. And I'll see you on the other side. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the first ever uh, show that I'm doing on this channel. I guess we'll call it the Amit Cook Rages Show. I'm here with an OG of the YouTube community and the Palantir community, Tom Nash. As per my analytics, I know a lot of you watch his channel, so I think a lot of you will enjoy this. First of all, I just want to say Tom Nash is a stand-up guy. Uh, I didn't have a lot of subscribers. He didn't refuse to do the interview. He responded to me on Twitter in like two minutes and said, yeah, I'm down to do it. So uh, for someone who has that much attention and fame on him, at least in the YouTube investing space, for him to do an interview with someone who's relatively not known, uh, it means a lot to me. So thank you, Tom, for taking your time, and I appreciate it, man. No, thank you. I mean... Uh... When I was starting out, nobody gave me the time of day. And uh, I, I thought to myself, if I ever make it big, I'm going to be different about it. So I try to promote other creators on my channel. And I definitely don't refuse any interview offers, especially from people who seem to be know what they're talking about. So I think it's going to be a fun interview. Absolutely. I love it. Now, I came across you randomly one day, I think around September, and this is sort of the beauty and the magic of YouTube, which is a random Russian dude pops into my feed. He has a nice thumbnail. I click it. I like the analysis. I subscribe. And now I'm hooked on to you forever. And uh, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this interview in terms of who you are as a person. I want to talk a little bit about the Fed, and then I want to get into Palantir because obviously... Uh, that's a position that I have that's heavy, and I know you have yeah. that's heavy as well. And we so can for, talk about Elizabeth Warren. And it, we we got to talk about Warren. We're going to get into it as well. Um, I'm, so, I'm still pissed off by her, bro. Well, let, let's get into that right now. Before I, I call her RWB, Rich White Babushka. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what Babushka means in Russian? No, but it's going to be something offensive. Grandma. No, it just means grandma. She's just this annoying grandma. Did you see she, 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 they said her net worth is like 12 million and she, or she has 12 Bro, million. Bro, she's in flying around in private jets and shit. She's a politician, which means she, by definition, she's mooching off everybody just so she can have her time, uh, basically uh, pretend like she's working hard. She doesn't pay a lot of taxes. I mean, she pays normal uh, upper class taxes. She's living the life on the, on the account of the taxpayers. And I'm fine with it. 
no problem. That's that's the definition of any politician. No issues. But like the audacity of that lady, mm. the, the sheer the chutzpah on her to come out and like call him a freeloader, bro. I mean, now, do you do you what? think she, do you think she knows this, but she has to play the political game? Like it's just at the end of the day, of she, she knows this. It's cheap. It's fucking bottom feeding. Yeah. Every politician has to pick up PR somewhere. So you have Bernie Sanders, which I don't agree with on probably 99% of the thing he's saying. But I mean, he's insanely consistent and he goes for unpopular opinions. He mm. knows he knows it's not going to be liked. He's not trying to win any friends. And he's basically saying the same thing he said like 40 years ago. Right. So got to respect the man. Even though Elon Musk, even Elon Musk, when he takes shots at him, it's never about like it's never personal with him. I don't know if you noticed. It's very different with Elizabeth Warren and, and the, like Bernie. Like he did the joke. Oh, I thought I didn't know he's still alive. Or like when did the um, tweet? Yeah. You know when uh, Bernie yeah. said like. So it's very like lighthearted. You can see he kind of likes Bernie. Like right. with Elizabeth, it's personal, bro. Like right. calling her a Karen. I mean, so uh, she knows. She she's trying to go for the cheapest populistic topic, which is. Uh, uh, I feel it's a little bit communist. Like the one thing I had, it's communism. I feel communism is the root of all evil. Mm. So she's going for this quasi-communist bullshit where she just says, well, you know, here's the rich guy. Get your pitchforks. Uh, like in Russia, uh, when the communists uh, started uh, rising to power, they would have this terminology to call the rich people who wouldn't give up their stuff and share. They call them kulak. Kulak right. in Russian, it means fist. And basically, people would go around pitchforks, basically uh, uh, killing these guys uh, that that wouldn't share on right. the name of the the equality and whatever. And we know how well that ended. Mm. So basically, she's picking up brownie points. She's trying to uh, to, to 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 talk to her constituency as if uh, she's fighting for the weak and depressed and oppressed. But the truth is, which is very sad, she picked a really bad adversary. For once. I feel like uh, it's such a lab for for Elon. Uh, it's not even fair. So she's trying. She knows. She knows what she's doing. But I think she didn't. She underestimated the power of social media. Right. Because it can be factually checked how much tax is going to pay this year. Everybody knows the number. It's the highest tax uh, bill I can think of in history of any country ever. Yeah, it's about fifty. Uh, so. Yeah, so it's like 53, it doesn't matter, it's still fucking high. And wow. uh, basically, so factually incorrect what she says. So that's number one. And even worse than that, I mean, even conceptually, a politician calling a guy who's like, it's not like he's a loan shark. It's not like he's a, he runs a gambling website. It's not like he runs a casino or some some dating app. Literally the trying to like, save the planet. Saving the planet. And then you call him a freeloader? Like, what have you done? What kind of accomplishments do you have? How much tax you paid last year? I'm not, like this. Is, like I think she got embarrassed. The problem is she lives in an echo chamber where media outlets like MSNBC will come out and say that she she won. But co- saying that she won this is like claiming that Tyson Fury lost all three fights against Wilder, bro. It's right. just laughable to me. We all know, and it doesn't have to be a Tesla fan or a Tesla hater. I mean, she got exposed, and I think. Uh, she learned a valuable lesson. If you're if you're gonna behave, uh, if you're gonna bark and bite and just misbehave, Caesar Milan will give you the. Tss. <laughs> tss. <laughs> that's it. That's it. They're like tss. Sit, sit back down, and that's it. Like, have you heard from Elizabeth Warren on the subject ever since? He basically, the, the the three tweets he like he demolished her. He ended their career, bro. She's Rage done. Matter. It's not even about like people say, well, like they're trying to, it, it makes her whole like uh, story about uh, her university application seem like even, it doesn't even matter right now. It's even more embarrassing. I mean, she's well, thought she's speaking an easy target because I don't think she thought he'd reply, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, Jeff Bezos stuff. would not have replied to this. Right. Like most billionaires would not reply to idiot politicians. But I mean, uh, she underestimated how much, how much, like, bro, Elon was liking my, like, like my tweet a few weeks ago and I'm a fucking nobody. Why? I mean, the why man you, is, you, for, for, so I, I want to talk about how you felt about that. Why do you think Elon is able to get away with this stuff, and someone like Jeff Bezos would never even think of having a witty remark? Like why? Because he owns it, man. He owns it. 
interesting. Like he owns yeah, but, it. But like, so for example, there are some things where I remember Elon was on the Joe Rogan podcast. Joe Rogan brought up some stuff about China. Elon, yeah. I think very clearly kept his mouth shut because he knows Tesla needs success in China. So there are some yeah. moments where he like, holds back. I think Bezos knows the entire world needs Amazon. So he has to hold his mouth back. But do you yeah. think in general, he just has the ability to own certain moments of his speech? And he well, he's to- playing the game. He's playing the game with China, bro. With China, is it's a totalitarian regime where, I mean, if you want to play in their backyard, you got to play by the rules. Right. He has a factory there and he's not going to be basically starting an unnecessary war for him. It's right. not his problem. The Chinese problem isn't his. It's actually Elizabeth Warren's problem, but she's right. doing nothing about it. Right. So I, he's the player. He's playing the game. He's telling to the Chinese what they want to hear. I think uh, um, it's it's normal. I don't. I I'm not bothered by it at all. I don't expect him to fight my wars for me. He's the CEO of a public company. Obviously, he's trying to. Uh, okay, I'll I'll tell you what. At this point, you have to ask yourself a question. So at this point, why is he still doing what he's doing? Does he need money? No. Well, I think this question would have been answered uh, years ago where uh, him and uh, Peter Thiel cashed out on PayPal. Right. He didn't need money then. At this point, if you if you make, I don't even remember how much 80 or 90 million dollars, bro, whatever he made from the PayPal transaction. So all you really need to is just buy a bunch of real estate and just retire. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to work a day in your life. I mean, even if, if you say, well, I'm going to invest it, you're not going to invest in a, in a space rocket company. Right. <laughs> That's like the stupidest decision ever. Like, yeah. and, like you, and so he's obviously not motivated by, uh, I mean, he likes money, I'm sure. And he likes to have nice things and, and spend it and whatnot. But I don't think he's motivated by, by cash. I think he has different stuff that motivate him. So uh, I don't think his, that's where I think he differs with uh, the other uh, kings. Oh, yeah. Because right now it's like this feudal society. We have King Jeff and King Elon and King Mark, all of these kings, and everybody's basically trying to get a plot of land on their on their on their kingdom. So You're basically saying I, Elon cares so much about actually saving the world that the Twitter stuff doesn't get to him because he actually doesn't care about money and things. Like no, that. he just owns it. You remember when the SEC fined him for this shit? Yeah, with the 420, yeah. he paid the fine. In fact, he actually purchased more Tesla stock so he can put another another 20 million on the Tesla books. So they can pay the fine. So they don't have to basically pay the fine out of pocket. And by the way, made 800 million on that thing. Yeah. Where, where Like Tesla was in the, do- in the toilet back then. Mm-hmm. So that transaction is like made him a lot of money. Just shows you, I mean, uh, he, once, listen, there's like two entities you don't screw around with. The SEC and the IRS. Right. Like he, he's already, like he already went, went ahead and basically got shellacked by them. And he's still doing the same stuff. Nothing has changed. What has changed since Elon pre SEC fine and now? It's the same behavior. So he's owning it. And people like, you know, when you walk out and like if you and me walk out on the street and we like go cut full Kyle Kuzma, you know, dressed in these ridiculous clothes or Russell Westbrook, whatever, if you own it, people just say, well, okay. But if you look embarrassed about it, like people will make fun of you. And he owns that shit. He owns, he owns the Twitter shenanigans and and that's why i think people just basically say well that's elon being elon no problem they accept it now yeah and i I think his ability to own it ultimately ends up becoming tesla like i was on his social blade this man gets one hundred thirty thousand followers on twitter a day like you kind of realize why they don't need marketing and sales anymore not only is the product phenomenal but his ability to create this persona around him it's something that i think he will inspire future ceos to do if they have life-changing companies if they have a real estate company where they got to protect margins they're probably not doing that yeah um, but if they're actually going for it, then they're going for it. Look how much, look how much exposure the, just the recent feud with Elizabeth Warren is. You yeah. might say, well, that's Elon being impulsive. I think that's Elon being a great marketer. Yeah. Look how much expo- free PR he got. It's like tens of millions of dollars of, of ads Literally. for him and his company Literally. for free. Everybody's talking about it. Good or bad. There's no such thing as bad PR. Even MSNBC, they're talking about it and saying that he lost the debate, whatever. And it, fucking idiots there's still a good pr for him he's getting out there the brand is getting out there i think he's a marketing genius how did you feel when he liked your tweet i almost fell from my seat bro <laughs> you think you th- like I, I can pretend like i didn't give a fuck i called like all the fifty-seven thousand people i know to let them know <laughs> like i call people i haven't talked about in years bro like hey you know johnny from sixth grade just want to let you know <laughs> you don't like my bro i 
two days spent calling everybody I know to let them know. You're being serious, uh, right? You're not joking. No, it's semi-serious, but it, I, I, no, 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 not really. But I, it was really cool, bro. I, I, I'm not gonna tell you like I was like, oh, nice. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um. Yeah, you got someone who's worth three hundred billion dollars acknowledging what you have to say, and then this attention economy for you to say something witty enough for him to even give it a, a second of attention. You know, it's hard. You know how much cryptocurrencies get created because he tweeted something about them. I mean, think about it. Like my friend Patrick Boyle, who has, by the way, one of the best finance channel on the planet. Mm-hmm. You should check him out. He has the whole video talking about how uh, the Elon Meter is now the basically the the valuation uh, methodology. All the old valuation me- methods don't mean jack shit. The only thing that matters is if Elon talks about you or not. <laughs> if you want to make money. How, uh, I want to go a little bit deeper into you for, for, for a little bit, then we'll get into pound here. How are you like as a child? You're very witty. You're aggressive. You, you're sarcastic. You're funny. Wh- when did that start happening as a child? Did you start noticing you have this type of personality that was attractive to people, obviously, to the tunes of hundreds of thousands following you? It's a good question. I've never been asked this, to be honest. Good. I've never been asked this. I got into a lot of trouble as a kid, bro. I can't even tell you how much. For some reason, I, not... I feel like that makes sense. As soon as you say that, that makes Ooh, sense. I was, uh, I was always in fucking serial trouble, bro. Always in trouble. I could never find a way just not to be me for a few minutes. It was always some... Uh, so my dad, I'll tell you a story. I've never told the story. My dad was, uh, uh, we were living um, in a small town on the coast of the Black Sea. Uh, it's kind of like a vacation city for all the communists. Well, back in the day, it was. Right. Everybody knows about it. If any Russian would know about it, the name wouldn't tell you nothing. But like, it's kind of like the Vegas of, of like old communist uh, era. And there's nothing really there that reminds Vegas at all. It's just a bunch of, you know, it's nice beaches, which Russia doesn't have a lot of. And just very sunny all the time and hotels. But there's like, I mean, when you live in the fucking cave, literally, I mean, that's a lot. Think right. about how you Russians used to live. Like most of them didn't have like uh, proper apartments and whatnot. And even like you have to understand Russian apartments. Like anyway, so we were living in this in the city, uh, right in the suburbs, a like huge fucking house. Uh, insane. I didn't I didn't think it was unusual then because I never knew anything else as a kid. My dad had a chauffeur and shit. He was uh, b- big with the party and he was managing one of the local factories and shit. He's a smart dude. Like my dad is like legitimately qualified. Your dad was he an has, entrepreneur? Was he like running his own? He thing? was pr- not then, but uh, that's a good question because in, in 1990, he was one of the first in Russia to right. have his own business. He right. was probably one of the first ever, bro. Right. It's insane. So good question. So basically my dad is fucking, is a, is a brilliant guy. He has, he did a whole fucking degree in the, uh, biomechanical engineering and then in fucking chemistry so he studied for 80 he's like he's not like one of those guys who got mooched into a position but he was also a good politician so he got into a good position he he really like i didn't even know that that was something unusual i thought everybody had chauffeurs and shit whatnot Mm. so basically uh, and i used to listen to him talk and he was also very aggressive on the phone and whatnot and i and i came uh, the the, i was in kindergarten and the fucking uh, teacher calls my mom to come and pick me up because you have to understand this is like North Korea. You don't say certain things. It's right. really, you can get in a lot of trouble right. because I was basically walking around with a fake phone, screaming at everybody on the phone, get the car over here. Like basically imitating my dad. <laughs> and it's very uncommon to do it. And she's like, come pick this kid up. <laughs> and I get like a whole like 24 hours. Like uh, my mom is basically screaming at me. What the fuck are you doing? Like we're going to get in trouble. Like, okay. so I didn't even think about it. Like it was a, uh, I was just trying to imitate my, my dad, bro. It was it came natural to me. Yeah. So I have like hundreds of these stories, bro. Like uh, I would burn shit up or break shit. And then uh, like I once broke a, a bunch of shit at home. And then my mom, my mom found that out. I was already like, yeah, I was a problem kid, bro. I why, was well, not... why, why do you think you were a problem kid? Like what was the reason for it? Do you just it's want the to same thing I have with my youngest right now? He's exactly me. So I have three kids two daughters and a son so my two daughters are like like straight eight students and like what, my what oldest ages? nine and six okay so my nine-year-old she's like in the in this special school for gifted kids you know the ones that the space engineers and whatnot she's like fucking brilliant and like a super athlete okay. so she's like i've never seen anything like this and my middle kid she's like the most her 
emotional quantity is like off the charts, bro. She's like outpacing me at this point. She's she's six. Right. Like she's I've never seen this empathy. Like she will be probably a doctor or a psychologist or something. It's insane. But my youngest is exactly like me. He's so tough to manage, bro. And now I understand my parents, bro. There's not a, an idle moment of something not breaking, something not smashing, bro. Some like he would, bro. He said the the most like uh he was in kindergarten and the, the teacher called my wife basically saying he told the, one of the citizens to shut the fuck up. <laughs> It's like he he's not even four. You. He's not even four. No, and, and so it's just like, why are you saying that? So I can see this now playing in my head. Is that this is my punishment, bro? Because this was literally me. Now I understand how difficult this was, bro. This was hell, bro, for my parents. Now I understand it. Um, but yeah, but so my my wife's father, he basically says, well, that's a that's a good thing. He's like that. He's going to be very successful in life. I said, yeah, well, probably, but I mean, that's a tough kid to manage, bro. Okay, so I, I want I want to take this and and sort of see how it goes from here. It seems like you were really different. You had this kind of urge to just be you, and then you went into corporate finance, and you know, kind of thinking of that, it seems like the personality you're describing is someone who like almost is an entrepreneur, but you went to corporate finance. Was there kind of yeah? Like, how do you? Okay, I'll tell that? you this story. I didn't even finish high school properly, so there was a change. So I was busy doing other shit. I was uh, smoking when I was since I was like 14. I don't smoke now. Were you in high school in Russia or the States? No, no, in Russia. Okay. So I, I, I was uh, I was a really I, I did. I was playing football and uh, smoking cigarettes and, and hitting on girls and didn't care about school at all. Even I didn't even properly graduate. bro. I was like a fucking bum. So at this point, the, the question was, would I ever would I ever even amount to anything or not? Mm. And then this this light bulb click in my head was like, oh shit, if I don't do anything, like I knew I had the brain power, but right. I just didn't give a fuck about school and whatever. I just, I was like, okay, I have to do something about it. So I went back and I just redid like the, the whole like three years within like six months uh. and aced everything. Like, like, and then like the offer started coming and then I got the offer from to go and actually, uh, go abroad and shit like a lot of doors open that i didn't know about right, right. and once i got into it it was like it's like the door opens you don't want to go back i mean it's pretty insane you have to understand the journey is fucking crazy bro you're right. going from the middle of nowhere into the fucking epicenter of the world bro i i i so my internship was I, when i started my first internship job was on 49 and 6 bro fucking right in front of rockefeller center bro mm. like this is, this is after college yeah that's like my first in paid internship, bro. Imagine going from where I started, bro, in the middle of fucking nowhere. Even though like we had like a decent life, it's still it's the middle of to this. Like it's insane. It's not something like uh, you want to say, oh no, I want to be an entrepreneur. No, motherfucker, this is insane. This is like, bro, like fucking NBA games and like fucking New York City and whatnot. Like it's unthinkable. Like you right. think of it and you say, oh, it's nice. No, for me it was I was in fucking outer space, bro. Right. This happened. I was, I was like, this is not real. Bro. Were, so your parents, were your parents okay with you going to the States? Were they encouraging of it? Yeah, of course. Every Russian wants to get the fuck out of Russia, bro. Uh. Nobody wants to. Do you? Okay. We would not have this discussion about Elizabeth Warren and Elon Musk if this was Russia. If Putin would have tweeted something about one of the people he doesn't like, there's no response. The guy probably has some poison in his underwear and fucking dies, bro. It's, it's like, it's literally what happened with Navalny. And well, he got him... He got him fucking out of country, bro. The dude was in the UK. He got him there, bro. So would you want to live in a country like this? Why do you think Americans in general don't value free speech as much given where you came from? Like you, you go like, is there any sort Good of macro political economic understanding? No, it's know? human. Great question. The reason they don't value it because they never had it taken away. Right. You only can value something if you never had it or it gotten taken away from you. So because you guys have never lost it, you don't understand what it's like not to have it, bro. Right. I've seen what it's like not to have it, bro. I'd be right fucking scared. Even my dad, who was like top, top notch rank guy, like it was you certain things you cannot say, bro. It's like life threatening. Imagine like saying things that are life threatening, bro. Yeah, like when Trump was president and I was in college during that time, I couldn't imagine not being able to say anything I wanted to about Trump or like having to go to jail for that. And as I've gotten older, so we're like, oh, shit, like, like I saw a North Korea documentary last night just because I was born. And I was like, wow, like there's certain things in the North world. Korea is a very good example. It's it's kind of it's a little bit worse than what I remember. 
but like Soviet Russia was not far away from this. Mm. You have to understand, it wasn't far away from this. People would take pride at snitching on their neighbors if they heard them saying something shitty about one of the the heads of state, and they would just fucking it, like it would be insane. It would be like a, you'd hear arguments in the street, people arguing who likes uh, Lenin better, who likes Lenin more, or Stalin more, like loud arguments. Just you know. <laughs> so what you see in North Korea is actually it's very close to what I seen as a kid, bro. Right, right. It's fucking crazy. Um, so. You can't value something you you you've always had plenty of, right, right. Uh, I I we're I think we're in a good pack. I'm gonna leave pound here for a little bit later. I still want to dig deep into this. What you're doing no on YouTube. Um. So I, I, how long did this take to get to two hundred thousand? Was this like a year? Has this been two years? How long have you been really doing? This? I just checked today, unrelated to you. I have a Instagram post of my hundred thousand, and it's exactly a year ago. Mm. So I can tell you so. To get from 100 to 260 took me a year. And to get from zero to 100 took me probably, I want to say, good four years. Okay. Uh, because when you start, at first you start and it's a little bit amateurish. You don't know what you're doing. And then you don't really take it seriously. And then you start taking it serious. So it's a process. You don't always immediately go full on Peter McKinnon, bro. And like just a million in a year for right. from, it's an outlier for most people it's a process so uh, my first year probably had like 600 subscribers and then uh, when it all started blowing up is uh, it's end of q1 2020 when it started going crazy when i went from 12000 to to 100 really and q1 12 to 100 okay yeah that happened when the when just i just i had this perfect storm moment i quit my job not knowing what i want to do just knowing i don't want to do this anymore and uh, all of a sudden covid happened so everybody was at home watching youtube and i was fucking bored because i wasn't working so i was making a lot of interesting youtube videos and people just it just clicked Mm. and then i was like oh shit i can make this thing that i'm passionate about actually live off it i was like oh shit this is insane when when i would do this for free when did you see the first uh, AdSense revenue check where you were like, this is, I need to go one It's never about money for me, to be honest. I did this for three years with no, in my first three years, even when I was monetized, I would sometimes wait for like four months for the minimum $100 to fill up so I can get a payment, bro. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's not even about the money for me. So what happened is I wasn't excited about the money. You know what I was excited about? When I first saw my Dan Bilzerian video goes to over 100,000 views. Right. It's like that moment. I was like, oh, sh- wow. I was so excited about the numbers. Not really. I was never obsessed about the money. I've already seen big money before. It didn't really bother me that I wasn't obsessed about it. Right. So when I quit, I made a decision not to be focused on monetary stuff. Anyways, when I saw the viewership, I was like, oh, shit. There's like two stadiums of people just watch this yeah. video. Yeah. I was like, yeah. So that the that ego trip is way more like a motivational thing for me than the the money, to be honest. That's why I don't try to push and upsell on my stuff. I can easily sell a course yep. and, and make, make a few million a year easily. No problem. Bro. And I can make a fucking banger of a course better than anything out there. It's not even, it's going to take me fucking two weeks to write it, bro. And right. I don't have to pay anybody to do it. Unlike certain other people, I'm not going to tell who, but I know who, <laughs> but I'm not uh, like, I won't say I would never do it. But if I do it, it's going to be when, if I want to do it, like just if I have some urge to do something different, I'm not going to do it to milk some more dollars, bro. So I, I, want to, I, I want to ask you a question that uh, Dave Leon Investing asked uh, Stephen from Solving the Money Problem, which is, do you see your investment in YouTube more bigger than your investment in Tesla or Palantir or any other stocks? I.e. the time and energy you're putting Yeah, in- I've said this. I've said, I've said this in, my, in my, one of my posts. I said, uh, you just to be clear, what, I have a community post saying I'm fr- I'm a content creator first, mm. investor second. There's no so nobody is ever confused about this. I think for Stephen it's vice versa. He's 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 a, an investor first, a cre- content creator second. Right. I'm much more focused on creating content I love, and then I enjoy investing uh, as part of the process. So it, I wouldn't like if I had the endless supply of money i would not invest anymore i would just fucking join myself but i would still make youtube videos for free right so that's that's why my passion is so right. 
making content and, and seeing how people interact with it is like uh, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world to be honest the yeah fact there's yeah, nothing like it nothing like it. and the fact that it's yeah. democratized like 50 years ago if you wanted to start a media brand like there, there's no way like the random guy like this is just not happening you know no and the the thing the most interesting thing is that it weeds out it, it weeds out a lot of people that are very talented I've yes. seen a lot of people yes. fall by the wayside, which deserved an audience and never got one. Yep. It's like watching a really talented musician on the street. It was like, shit, this guy should. There's no, like people say, oh, you deserve a million subs. Motherfucker, I don't deserve jack shit. There's mm-hmm. no entitlement here. It's no, like, I've, been, it's... I've been seeing some people say that on my videos, like this deserves a million views. And I'm like, not until I'm consistent enough for the algorithm to care about me. You know, even like... then the algorithm is like, it's even then it's like, you need a certain amount of luck as well yeah. like if, if the pandemic doesn't happen when i started making a lot of videos maybe my channel doesn't even happen right. it's like anything that happens needs also a little bit of luck right all right we have about six minutes and 30 seconds left because tom's fucking computer wasn't working for 20 minutes <laughs> i'm so, sorry okay. let's talk about palantir Wait, yeah we'll do it maybe we'll do a part two one day who knows uh palantir what does it take for a yes. trillion dollar company so it probably has another good five to six years until it gets to their trajectory. It's an easy question for me to answer, but I also want to give you some more extra stuff. So Palantir has to make the transition eventually from a pure business to business service provider. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, they're a really good SaaS company right now with a lot of uh, uh, great clients, but they're pure B2B SaaS. Uh, at this configuration, the max you can get to is about $200 billion. Really? Using... You think B2B can only scale to $200 billion? I don't think this. I know this. Okay. Look at the top 20 companies in the world. Find me a company there that doesn't have a B2C uh, uh, um, uh, feature. The only one you will find is Salesforce. Yeah. It's the first one you find yeah. is Salesforce. It's number 22, I think, or 21. It's a $200 billion company. And you can, oh, people say, well, AWS is mostly like what Amazon, yeah, but Amazon has a retail business. Yeah. Microsoft has a B2C business, Facebook. Like, you can go one by one and you see all of them have some sort of, so it has to go from B2B to eventually they must come out with the B2C product and the solution. I have my imagination what it could be. Uh, and I've talked about it before. I mean, if they can take massive amounts of data from from <laughs> insane amount of, from, from an airline builder, they can definitely take your data and, and give you some suggestions on how to improve your fitness, your money, your lifestyle, your psyche, but, whatever. What, would that make that act? Because there's apps like My Fitness Pal and shit where you plug in your account. No, no, no. That's completely different, bro. So how, how do you next, describe that first? Next level shit. Like, next, like one, one, one solution that basically tells you everything you need to know about how to optimize your life. We think you need to read this book. Because we've seen that you do the, the, we think you need to eat more this and this and this. We think that in your exercise, you're not doing this correctly because of this and this. We think that you should get more sleep because we think that like complete, a complete kind of a. Almost the, virtual if, assistant on steroids kind of. Like a kind of like a, it's almost like sci-fi, but basically they know everything about you, your bank account, your fitness record, your health record, dentals everything what you surf what you watch which porn you watch which uh, which books you read everything so basically they can take all of this unrelated information and put into one suggestion model which is exactly what they do for for the for these businesses now uh, i have some notes here prepared i never prepare for these but i wanted to prepare for this one because i want to give it this stuff look some numbers i put on my screen you can't see it so okay so people say that it's expensive. I went ahead before this meeting today and I checked what was the Friday valuations. So Palantir is 25 price to sales. The ratio is 25 price to sales. So I looked at, and people compare it to like a value place. Look at the comparables. I chose Snowflake, Datadog, and Cloudflare. Mm-hmm. Basically three companies that are in the same industry. By the way, Snowflake, I think is an inferior product in the little thing that they actually overlap on. Snowflake is trading at 84 compared to the 25 of Palantir. Yep. Datadog, 53. Yep. Cloudflare, 67. So saying that Palantir is expensive is kind of ridiculous if you look at the actual competition. Now, also, I made some notes. I think they're inflation-proof. Uh, they do, uh, be- basically, mm, I think they're most valuable when there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of uh, new parameters coming to the, to the, to the market. So essentially, uh, that they have high stickiness 
rich clients that can tolerate increased prices. They have totally scalable business because it's completely SaaS and no debt and plenty of cash. And they're generating, look, last quarter generated $120 million free cash flow. Revenue is growing, look, what, 36% quarter over quarter from last quarter. Commercial revenue and government revenue grew 37, 34% year yeah. over year. Like, look, I am have this here. Q3 deal flow, 55 new deals just in Q3, $1 million more. If 33, 5 million plus deals in Q, Q3. And they're about to end this, this year with the 1.5 billion trailing 12 months revenue right. and the 40% guidance. And they're getting into crypto, which is a $2 trillion market. I mean, if you don't think that this is an opportunity at 30 billion or whatever they're trading right now, I mean, no problem. Go right ahead. There's other companies for you. I like this valuation 25. It's you ultimately epic. see the growth potential is just something. And I, I guess my, we have literally a minute, 40 seconds left. That's when this is going to end. Do you see this as like buying Tesla around 2018, 2019? Of course. Of course. That's, I've been very vocal about this. That's why I'm not really interested in entry prices. People, oh, should I get it 24? Should I wait until 15? What the fuck does it matter? People's like, oh, my, I'm waiting until it drops to 10. If this is, if this is even goes to $200 billion company, which means it like what, 5X, 6X right now, you still yeah. want to make a lot of money. Would you care about what were your entry price was if it was 15 or 25? It's like asking, oh, dear Tesla investor that bought it uh, in the beginning, did you buy a 20 or $25 Tesla stock? I mean, who gives a shit? Yeah. Yeah. That's not. But that's... Uh, you don't have to believe it. It's fine. It's a high conviction stock for me. But people say, people might say, well, we don't understand it. And that's fine. There's like, 57,000 different companies you can invest in. No problem. Right. All right. That's all the time we got today. Thank you, Tom, for taking the time out of day. And because this, we did it short, uh, we can schedule one more. We'll do part two if you want. Okay. Part two. So this was like, you got it right there. We're going we're gonna to yeah. go deeper into Pound Tier. Go deeper into How those. much likes do you usually get in your videos? So I'm, I, for 1.5 thousand subscribers, I'm averaging about 1.2 thousand views. So I feel like the ratio is good. About 100 likes, 120 likes per If video. we get more than 100, I'll do part two. All right. There we go. 100 likes. Thank Done. you, Tom. I hope people enjoyed a little bit of in, in, inklings into your personal life. And uh, we'll talk more about Palantir in part two. This Thank was you. epic. Part two coming up if you do 100 likes. All right. Talk to you later, Tom. Peace out. Bye.